All right, hello, hello everyone. It's time to find out what do you know about the second half of area study one for economics. So we're gonna be looking at the, the behavioral economics side of things. So um, the things, the traditional and modern view of consumer behavior and the same for business behavior. I'm gonna smash through this. It's only really like 10 slides of content. So then we will have a recap of all of the first area study done. Um, if you're interested in any of the area study two stuff, that's all there already. And you can check that out at your own time. So let's get straight into it. So first up, we're gonna look at the behavior of consumers. There's a whole bunch of text there that hopefully you're not reading right now, but we're gonna go through it slide by slide and get through a whole lot of it in a short amount of time. So um, first we're gonna look at the traditional economic viewpoint of consumer behavior, um, which basically all boils down to traditionally, we see um, consumers as being rational people who make informed decisions by getting all the information or information available to make a decision that will maximize their living standards. So they're saying that with every purchase that a consumer will make in the traditional viewpoint, they will always make decisions that will maximize their outcome, maximize their utility, and they will always do that with all of the best information available. Hopefully you're already thinking like about your own spending and thinking about the things you buy that maybe don't maximize your living standards or are just a terrible use of money. But um, this is the traditional viewpoint. So traditionally, um, consumers are going to use their money to maximize their living standards. Um, so there are some factors that might influence the way that we spend our money as consumers. So things like utility maximization. So it's seen that most of the time we're gonna try and spend our money on the things that will maximize our satisfaction out of life. So we're gonna satisfy our needs before our wants. So most of us, when we get paid, we'll pay the bills for the utilities, we'll pay for groceries, we'll pay for petrol, all the things that we need to do first before we start looking at those extra little things that are gonna make us more satisfied later on. We also work within budget constraints. So we try and live within our means. Um, a rational consumer or a traditional consumer would not go heavily into debt to satisfy their needs and wants. But as you'll probably know from these days and from Australia in general, uh, Australia has a massive household indebtedness ratio, meaning that people have way more debt than they do savings. So maybe people in Australia don't really work within budget constraints. Then we've got internal influences. So things like personality types, ethics, habit. So you might not purchase certain things based on your ethics. So you might not purchase animal products. You might not purchase things that are tested on animals. You might not purchase things that, so like, for example, if you go to the supermarket and you see bananas in packaging, so it's on a like polystyrene plate, which has then been glad wrapped. Personally, I would never buy that because internally, I think that's dumb. Bananas come in their own packaging, therefore they don't need to be covered in plastic and there's just a waste that's gonna hurt the environment. Um, other people do things out of habit. So some people do the same things every single day. So some people will buy a coffee on their way to work. That's an internal influence that is following a habit. Um, external influences can be things like your culture. So if, say for example, sorry, we've been watching a lot of MasterChef at the moment, but um, if you're Italian, you're probably gonna eat a lot of pasta and therefore you're probably gonna buy a lot more pasta. This is very stereotypical, but um, that's probably likely to be the case. Um, also marketing can affect you a lot from external side of things. So the whole point of marketing or good advertising is to make wants into needs. And so really good marketing will make you want things a whole lot more. Um, and so this is why companies pay millions upon millions of dollars to have ads during the Super Bowl, because then they can make people need to buy their product rather than just want it. Um, other things can be the government. So the government can force you to spend money on certain things. Um, the easiest example of this is when they legislate certain things. So um, things being illegal until you're over 18. Therefore, that's an external influence that prevents you from purchasing certain goods and services. If you want to ride a bike, you legally need a helmet. So therefore, the government has externally influenced you that you need to have a helmet. So then we've got developments in research about consumer behavior. So, and including the contribution of behavioral economics. So we know that the modern consumer definitely is not rational and is often manipulated by businesses or marketing into behaving in ways that may not maximize their living standards. So um, 
there are a lot of different ways that this works, but I always think of examples of like when I was back in high school and people would have a part-time job and you'd see them get paid on a Wednesday or a Thursday and they would spend all of their pay before the weekend and then have no money until the, for the rest of the week. Because especially when you're a teenager, you're not rational. Um, your frontal lobe hasn't fully developed yet. And therefore you can be a lot more impulsive and buy things um, that may not maximize your living standards. So the fact that I used to always laugh when I was a teenager or late teenager and my late teens working at McDonald's and you'd see all the younger people would be working a four hour shift. They'd get given a break in that shift for some reason. And during their break, they'd spend like 10 to $20 on McDonald's. And you're just like, what are you doing? This is like probably like a third of your pay for the shift. Like, are you insane? And so the modern consumer doesn't always act rationally. They don't always do things with the full information available and therefore they don't always make the best decisions that maximize their living standards. Then next we've got how consumers might respond to positive and negative incentives. So this always gets analogy, um, turned into an analogy of the carrot and the stick. So positive incentives work as a carrot, which means it's a reward for doing good behavior. So, um, Sometimes you get given positive incentives, like some businesses use this through like loyalty systems. It's like if you buy five drinks, the sixth one is free. That's a carrot. They're dangling it in front of you being like, hey, if you keep shopping here, we'll give you something back. And they're trying to get you to keep going about that same behavior. And so you'll buy five drinks and you'll get excited about that sixth one being free and you'll probably keep shopping there. Um, you might not have bought that many things from them otherwise, but because you know there is that positive thing in the future, it gets you to keep shopping there and manipulate you in that way. Negative incentives being a stick, they're a punishment for doing the wrong behavior. So most recently, one of the biggest versions of those has been the fines for not social distancing, the $1,652 fine. Um, that's a pretty big negative incentive. It really works to prevent people from going out and not doing the behaviors that they're meant to do. So. Negative incentives are any way in which you are being punished for the wrong behavior and that affects your, the way you spend your money. Then one of the last points about consumers is the effects of technological change on consumer behavior. So technology has given us um, access to way more choice um, and information than anyone before in history. And this changes the way that we operate as consumers. So for example, if you're me, which you are not hopefully, um, unless I'm rewatching this to relearn the content, um, often if I'm at the shops, which doesn't happen much at the moment because you're not meant to go there, I always have my phone with me. And if I see something that I like, I just go straight to my phone, boop, 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 Google it, see if it's cheaper anywhere else. Look at the reviews of it, see if it's good or not. And whereas in the past, like when I was younger, when my parents were growing up, you basically went to the shops and if they had what you wanted, you just got it because it was the only way you could get it without waiting months and months. Whereas now you could, might be able to see it online um, buy it and have it tomorrow or have it in some extreme cases, have it later today. And so technology has really changed how we consume because we just have access to way more things than ever before. Basically, if you can think of a product, it probably exists somewhere on the internet. Um, whereas in previous generations, you just had to deal with what existed and what was around. So it's a very, very big change. And then we get into how businesses behave and how businesses operate. So, the traditional viewpoint of businesses um, is profit maximization. So as you can see, money, 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 that's what they care about a lot. They want to have the least costs available for the maximum sales. So businesses are all about cost cutting for profit maximization in the traditional viewpoint. And that's still true to some extent with some businesses. Um, so they want to maximize their overall so how businesses might respond to positive and negative incentives. So some positive incentives used for businesses can be things like tax cuts, tax offsets, subsidies, um, grants, which is an amount of money given to businesses for certain behaviors. These can promote businesses to produce certain goods and services as it's more profitable to do so. So for a long period of time, the government was giving subsidies to businesses that produce solar panels. Um, and therefore it made more businesses want to produce solar panels because it was more profitable to do so because the government was covering some of their cost of production. There are other things like if you're a business and you conduct research and development, you get a 45% tax offset, meaning they pay 45% less tax because they conducted research and development, which then 
makes businesses want to conduct research and development because they're going to pay less tax. So even if the research and development doesn't work out, they're still better off. And if the research and development does work out, it's a double win because they're going to get whatever benefits from their research and they're going to pay less tax. So that's a positive incentive for businesses to behave a certain way. Negative incentives can attempt to dissuade businesses from um, producing specific undesirable goods and services. So we've got things like excise taxes that are charged to the producers of like cigarettes, petrol, etc., to try and get them to produce less of that. Um, same as like gambling, there's high taxes paid on gambling. The downside of that is a lot of the um, products and services that have negative incentives placed on them are still highly profitable. So businesses still produce a whole lot of them because it still makes them a lot of money. So they're not really de-incentivized too much. Then we start to look at how businesses have actually changed in the modern time. So there started to be more of a focus on goals such as sustainability, community involvement, gender equality, innovation, and research and development. So um, things like sustainability, there's been a big push, especially through like cafes and restaurants um, to have environmentally sustainable packaging. So you've got things like this example up here on the screen. Some um, cafes give a discount if you bring your own keep cup. Not at the moment because you can't bring a keep cup anywhere as a um, during a pandemic, but eventually that will probably exist again. Um, most companies these days try and use recyclable packaging. You've seen um, the actual government mandate that businesses can no longer use single use plastic bags, which is really, really important. Um, as a push towards sustainability, you see a lot more community involvement. So you see things like um, Grill does the local matters where you can um, buy a burger, you get given a bottle cap and you can feel good about putting it in one of the three things to feel like you are contributing to something in the local community. And they do that because by you feeling good when you shop there, you're probably gonna shop there again. And so it feels like you're giving back. Could Grill just donate the money to charity in the first place? Probably but then they wouldn't get the sale of those burgers, which they want equally, if not more. We've got gender equality is more and more important. So there's been more and more pushes for um, female representation in the workplace, as well as in higher positions within companies, which wasn't happening before, as well as um, reducing the pay gap that currently exists, which still exists and continues to exist for some reason. Um, Innovation is a big thing. So especially in Australia, as we are slowly losing our ability to just focus on um, exporting raw minerals to foreign countries, especially China, who is not the most happy with us at the moment. Um, innovation is really important. Um, innovation has been important in Australia for a long time, but that is probably really important into the future as we will be needing to innovate and change the way we produce to remain profitable in the long term. You see it at the moment in a pandemic, businesses have to innovate, change, to survive. So you'll see, like you've seen, hopefully um, things like cafes, because they no longer can have people eat in, they've had to move to doing takeaway only, which to do that effectively, they've had to then be involved in having some kind of app for people to order on, to minimize contact. And that's a form of innovation to try and be more successful and get more sales in that way. Similar sort of research and development, trying to come up with new ways to produce and um, exist as a business that will hopefully get more sales and more profitable in the long term while also looking good in the eyes of the community. So we've got the effect of technology on business behavior and the trade of goods and services. So businesses are increasingly using technology to reach more customers or replace labor in the workplace and therefore increase their profitability. So use the example just before of businesses getting involved with using apps, etc., for ordering um, or things like you see like touch screens, um, at McDonald's for ordering or self-serve checkouts at most supermarkets and um, big stores these days. All of this goes to make businesses more efficient, which is great. Uh, it also gives a lot more um, information and power to consumers, which is probably a good thing, but it also replaces labor because for a business, it's kind of it's ingenious to have 12 self-serve checkouts with one person overseeing all of them rather than 12 people working on 12 different checkouts. Like you are saving hundreds of dollars an hour by doing that, which is very, very significant to them overall. So businesses are using technology to hopefully become more productive, more efficient, and increase their profitability by doing that. And then lastly, 
the nature and effectiveness of strategies businesses use to increase profitability, including price discrimination, multiple branding, and illegal anti-competitive behavior as outlined in the Australian Competition and Consumer Act. Um, hopefully we've got notes on this, but we're gonna briefly go through some of it. So one of my favorite ones to look at as a strategy that some businesses use to try and be more profitable is multiple branding because it often surprises a lot of students about how it exists. So I've got an example of an image here on the slide of the retail apparel group, and they own the businesses Terracash, YD, Connor, Johnny Big, and something else. But the interesting thing is most people, when they look at those businesses, they see them as direct competitors. So what tends to happen is they'll go to one of those businesses. If they don't have what they want, they'll just go to the next one or compare the prices between them. And at the end of the day, they're gonna shop at one of those if they're in like trying to get like men's formal way. And it's kind of ingenious by the business because by owning all of the competitors, no matter what, they're getting the profit. And this also exists if you look at like toiletries. So things like um, moisturizers, body wash, soaps, etc., deodorants. Um, if you look at, I think it's um, Unilever is the company. If you look them up, they own probably 90% of the brands that are um, the options that you're given there. And so if you look at like things like Rexona, Lynx, Dove, et cetera, they're all owned by the same company. And it's a way that the company tries to make the most money possible by being all of your choices. And so you may think that you are being like, oh, this one's not on sale, I'll get the other one. Still, the money's going to the same company. So therefore, it's a strategy they use to be as profitable as possible. Um, some of the other strategies mentioned here are not legal, so therefore they aren't used as much anymore. So things like price discrimination, which is charging different prices based on people's races, genders, etc., which um, happened a lot in the gold rush in Australia, but hasn't happened a whole lot since. Then other anti-competitive behavior. So if you've been following the news at all, at the moment, China has accused Australia of anti-competitive behavior. They accused us of what's called um, dumping barley over in China. And so because of that, they've put an 80% tariff on barley because they think that we're acting in an anti-competitive way. And so in Australia, we actually have laws that prevent businesses from doing things that are anti-competitive. So if they do things that are exist to hurt other businesses, they will face large fines for that. A major one for that that occurred um, a few years ago now is that Coles and Woolworths through their petrol wings of their business were offering if you spent over $100 in one of the supermarkets, you'd get 20 cents off per litre of petrol at their fuel chain. And they got in trouble with the ACCC because basically the ACCC decided that Coles and Woolworths were happy to make a loss on petrol because they were making so much money on groceries because if they made a loss on petrol, they were selling at such a low price that they were hurting all the independent suppliers and were gonna put them out of business. And as soon as they put those independent suppliers out of business, they could jack up the prices and be even more profitable in the petrol market as well. All right, that's all of that for this second half of area study one. I hope that was useful for you. If you have any questions about any of this at all, feel free to leave me a comment somewhere, send me a message, send me an email, and I'll be more than happy to help you. If you wanna look at anything about area study two, um, just follow the playlist here or follow any of the other links that will show you all the other videos about um, the um, markets and all that kind of stuff. So supply, demand, etc. cetera. Other than that, I hope you have a great day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.